So now we take a look at electrolyte balance. Electrolytes are physiologically important for multiple reasons. First of all, they're chemically reactive and to participate in many metabolic processes. Second of all, they're going to determine the electrical potential or the charge difference across membranes, which is really important when we consider about um, action potential conduction and muscle stimulation. And they strongly affect the osmolarity and distribution of body fluids. The main cations that we'll look at are sodium, potassium, calcium, and hydrogen ions. And the main anions will be chloride, bicarbonate, and phosphate. And we'll leave further examination of hydrogen and bicarbonate until the next section. There are big differences in the electrolyte concentrations of blood plasma and intracellular fluid. So blood plasma exhibited up here in the top figure, and down below we'll see the um, intracellular fluid concentrations. You'll notice, first of all, that sodium is much higher in the plasma than it is in intracellular fluid, and potassium the opposite. Chloride is high in blood plasma, but low in intracellular fluid. And phosphate, high in intracellular fluid, low in blood plasma. However, you will also notice that 300 milliosmolar is common to both the intracellular fluid as well as the blood plasma. So they have the same osmolarity. Sodium has many functions. First of all, it's the principal ion that's responsible for resting membrane potentials. When we think about an action potential running down a neuron, it's inflow of sodium through these membrane gates that's an essential event in depolarization. And that underlies both nerve and muscle function. We'll see that it's the principal cation in extracellular fluid, so outside the cells. Sodium salts account for about 95% of the osmolarity in extracellular fluid. So it's the most significant solute that's going to determine the total body water and how it's distributed among all the different fluid compartments. Sodium gradient that's created by sodium potassium pumps, leaving lots of sodium in the extracellular fluid, is a huge source of potential energy. As we've seen, sodium's used for co-transport of other solutes such as glucose, potassium, and calcium. And then the sodium-potassium pump, as you know, it inter exchanges intracellular sodium for extracellular potassium, so kicks sodium out and draws potassium in. And the whole process uses lots of ATP and it generates body heat. Finally, sodium bicarbonate has a huge role in buffering of pH for extracellular fluids. So how do we keep sodium in homeostasis? We've already examined a fair number of these mechanisms. First of all, adults only need about half a gram of sodium per day, per day but the typical American diet consists of a lot more than that, three to seven grams of sodium per day. It's in so many of our packaged products. The primary concern for all this additional sodium is excretion of the dietary sodium by the kidneys. Now, if the kidneys can keep up with the excretion of the excess dietary sodium, then there's no problem with the excess consumption. However, if the kidneys are having problems keeping up, then we're going to see that problems arise. Sodium concentration is coordinated by several hormones. We've already examined a lot of these. First of all, aldosterone, our salt-retaining hormone, has its primary role in adjusting the sodium excretion rates. Hyponatremia and hyperkalemia, so excess calcium and low sodium, will directly stimulate the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone, which then puts in measures to affect sodium reabsorption. Hypertension stimulates sodium secretion 
by way of the renin-angiotensin system. Aldosterone receptors are only found in the ascending limb of the nephron loop in the distal convoluted tubule and the cortical part of the collecting duct. And so in those regions, they're going to stimulate the reabsorption of sodium. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone, so it binds directly to nuclear receptors. So the hormone makes its way into the cell, binds to the nuclear receptors, and then it activates transcription of the gene that makes sodium and potassium pumps. It takes about 10 to 30 minutes for enough sodium potassium pumps to get inserted to the plasma membranes and to make a noticeable effect on the reabsorption of sodium into the tissues of the kidney from the tubule and the release of potassium from those tissues. So we're going to see that the tubules in the presence of aldosterone reabsorb more sodium, secrete more hydrogen and potassium. Water and chloride are going to passively flow with the sodium, so they follow them back into the tissues of the kidney, thus retaining them. The primary effects of aldosterone are that urine is going to contain less sodium chloride and more potassium, and it's going to have a lower pH or be more acidic. We'll see that there's elevated blood pressure is going to inhibit the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism, in which case the kidneys reabsorb almost no sodium. And the urine is going to contain 30 grams of sodium per day instead of the normal 5 grams. And that's a good thing. We can get rid of urine, um, sodium in urine if we have aldosterone to regulate that. Antidiuretic hormone also modifies the function of the kidneys. Now we looked at all these hormones already, so most of this is review. Antidiuretic hormone, diuretic, is going to prevent diuresis, so it modifies water excretion separate from sodium excretion. As you remember, it has to do with putting more aquaporins in the membrane so that we can have water reabsorbed. High sodium concentration in the blood is going to stimulate the posterior lobe of the pituitary, and that'll secrete antidiuretic hormone. This causes the kidneys to reabsorb more water through the mechanism of producing new aquaporins, and it'll slow down any further increase in blood sodium concentration. A drop in sodium is going to inhibit antidiuretic hormone release, and so we'll see more water excreted, thus raising the sodium levels in the blood. So ADH, again, works by changing the amount of water that's retained and thus affecting the osmolarity of the retained solutions. The third hormone that we look at, we've already seen, is atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide. They both have the same sort of effect, just differ in their locations of manufacture. They will inhibit sodium and water reabsorption, and they'll inhibit the release of, of renin and thus ADH. Kidneys are going to eliminate more sodium, and that's going to lower the blood pressure because with the sodium goes water. A couple of other things are going to influence sodium levels. Estrogen mimics aldosterone, and that's why we tend to, as women, retain water during certain times of the month and certainly during pregnancies. So there's edema in the tissues because of estrogen levels being high. Progesterone is going to act to reduce sodium reabsorption, and thus it has an anti it has a diuretic effect. So we lose more water in the urine because we're reducing the sodium reabsorption, and thus we don't have more water retained by the tissues or reabsorbed by the tissues. Sodium homeostasis is achieved by regulating salt intake. 
And so we'll see that salt cravings, if you don't have enough sodium in the system, there'll be salt cravings. For example, if I run a lot and sweat a lot, then I'm losing a lot of salt. I tend to crave very salty foods. French fries are my one, but that's only because they come with a lot of salt. And then I put more salt on them. And there's no problem in consuming excess sodium so long as the kidneys are doing their job and releasing all that excess sodium. A couple of sodium imbalances. We have hyponatremia and hypernatremia. So hyper meaning more, natrium, salt, emia, blood. So hypernatremia. We'll see plasma sodium concentrations getting above 145 milli equivalents per liter. Sometimes we'll see that from administration of IV saline, from water pretension, from hypertension, and edema. Hyponatremia is much less common. It's where plasma sodium concentrations are less than 130 milli equivalents per liter. Person's going to lose large volumes of sweat or urine, is going to lose a lot of salt because salt is involved in release of urine and release of sweat. And if we replace it with just plain drinking water, then we're not replacing any of the sodium, and thus we'll see hypotonic solution, hyponatremia. If we have excess body water, we can quickly correct that by excretion of the excess water. Next, we'll look at potassium functions, homeostasis, and imbalances. Potassium is the most abundant cation of the intracellular fluid, whereas sodium was for the extracellular fluid. It's the greatest determinant of the intracellular osmolarity and thus cell volume. With sodium, it helps produce the resting membrane potentials and also is involved in action potentials of nerves and muscle cells. Sodium-potassium pump, co-linked with sodium, also generating heat. And it's also an essential cofactor for protein synthesis and many other metabolic processes. Potassium homeostasis is closely linked to that of sodium. 90% of the potassium in the glomerular filtrate is going to be reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. The rest of it is excreted in the urine. However, the distal convoluted tubule and the cortical portion of the collecting duct are going to secrete potassium back in to the urine in response to the varied blood levels of potassium. Aldosterone is involved in stimulating the secretion of potassium, the secretion of potassium into urine. Finally, we move on to potassium imbalances. These are the most dangerous imbalances of all electrolytes. It can literally kill you. Hyperkalemia, so having too much potassium in the system, is going to have a couple of different types of effects. This depends on whether the potassium concentration rises quickly or slowly. When the concentration rises very quickly, like in the event of a crush injury where cells are lysed, or perhaps a blood transfusion where outdated blood has been transfused, those er Erythrocytes are going to leak potassium because they're aging, and that's going to cause a rapid increase in extracellular potassium. And this rapid increase makes nerves and muscle cells abnormally excitable. And they're abnormally excitable, as you see in this figure down below. You've got normokalemia, where there's a normal concentration of calcium inside and out of the cell, and we have a normal resting membrane potential. However, if for some reason we get excess um, potassium outside the cell, we're going to see that there's 
more diffusion of potassium into the cell, less diffusion of potassium out of the cell. And because there's less diffusion of potassium out of the cell, we're going to see that there's more positive charges inside and thus an elevated resting membrane potential or a less negative resting membrane potential. And that would cause the cells to be more excitable because we're closer to the potential needed for depolarization of the cell. However, if the potassium rise is slow, it's actually going to cause inactivation of voltage-gated potassium channels. And those potassium channels remain inactive until the resting membrane potential returns. And thus muscles become much less excitable. And that can produce cardiac arrest because the muscle's not going to contract. And if the heart stops contracting, then we've definitely got a problem. Potassium, high doses of potassium are often administered by veterinarians in euthanasia of animals and are used by some states in the lethal injection. So this extra potassium in the solution can certainly cause cardiac arrest. Hypokalemia, where there's much less potassium in the blood than necessary, can result from chronic sweating, vomiting, or diarrhea rarely results from a dietary deficiency. And this is going to make muscle cells much less excitable, which results in muscle weakness, loss of muscle tone, decreased reflexes, arrhythmias from irregular electrical activity in the heart. So we'll see here in the figure below, normal condition in turn, um, potassium is moving into the cell and out of the cell at fairly equal rates. Sodium potassium pump, pumping the potassium out, diffusing back in. And in hypokalemia, we'll see that there's a greater movement of potassium out of the cell and less movement of potassium into the cell. This greater diffusion of potassium out of the cell is going to result in positive charges leaving and thus more negativity in the membrane potential. And that makes it much harder to elicit an action potential. And thus we see the weaknesses. So now that we've looked at the homeostatic mechanisms that control sodium and potassium, it makes sense to look at chloride. First of all, chloride functions it's the most abundant anion in the extracellular fluid, and thus it's a major contributor to extracellular fluid osmolarity. It's required for the formation of stomach acid, hydrochloric acid. It's involved, as we already have seen, in the chloride shift that accompanies the carbon dioxide loading and unloading in red blood cells. And it has a major role in regulating body pH, so we'll examine it again in the next section. So chloride has a strong attraction to sodium, potassium, and calcium. And so it passively follows these as they are actively moved in various directions. Its primary means of homeostasis is achieved as an effect of sodium homeostasis. So as sodium is retained, chloride ions follow passively. If chloride is an imbalance, hyper chloremia or hypochloremia. Usually hyperchloremia is a result of dietary excess or administration of IV saline. Hypochloremia is often a side effect of hyponatremia. As we've lost a lot of sodium, chloride passively follows. Sometimes, however, it's an effect of hyperkalemia or acidosis. So excess potassium can sometimes cause hypochloremia. The primary effects, we're going to definitely see disturbances in acid-base balance. So again, something to address in the next section. So now on to calcium. Calcium has many important functions. First of all, it lends strength to the skeleton. As we know, deposition of hydroxyapatite. Calcium is also involved in activating the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. As you'll remember, it's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum binds to troponin so that tropomyosin can move aside and the myosin heads can contact the actin. 
It serves as a second messenger for some of the hormones and neurotransmitters. You'll remember from last semester looking at second messenger systems with the endocrine. Calcium also activates exocytosis of neurotransmitters and other cellular secretions. For example, at the neuromuscular junction, calcium enters the synaptic bouton and causes release of vesicles of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And finally, it's an essential factor in blood clotting. Calcium's homeostasis is maintained by parathyroid hormone, calcitriol or vitamin D, and calcitonin in children. These hormones are going to affect bone deposition, bone reabsorption, the absorption of calcium across the intestine, and the urinary excretion of calcium. If you'd like to review these functions, you can do so by revisiting Chapter 7. Cells maintain a very low intracellular calcium level. And the reason for this is it needs to prevent calcium phosphate crystals from forming. So phosphate levels are maintained very highly in the intracellular fluid, again, primarily because the sodium-potassium pump is transporting sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. So in order to prevent these calcium phosphate crystals from forming, the cells have to actively pump calcium out of the cell to keep the intracellular concentration nice and low. Or they need to sequester all the calcium in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, for example, in muscle cells. And it's only released when it's needed. Calcequestrin is a molecule that's going to bind to calcium and keep it unreactive. So in calcium storage cells, we don't see the formation of these calcium phosphate crystals because calcequestrin is holding on to the calcium. As far as calcium imbalances are concerned, again, we could have hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia. Hyperacalcemia results from alkalosis, hyperparathyroidism, hypothyroidism, and it'll reduce the membrane sodium permeability and thus inhibit the depolarization of nerve and muscle cells. And if we see concentrations greater than 12 milliequivalents per liter, we can really see muscular weakness, depressed reflex, and often cardiac arrhythmias. Hypocalcemia results from vitamin D deficiency, diarrhea, pregnancy, acidosis, lactation, hypoparathyroidism, or hyperthyroidism. Hypocalcemia will increase the membrane sodium permeability and it causes nervous and muscular systems to be abnormally excitable. If you have excessively low levels of calcium, we'll see tetanus form and that can result in laryngospasm, which will cause suffocation and eventually death. So finally, we examine phosphate. Phosphate's relatively concentrated in the intracellular fluid, and that's a result of hydrolysis of ATP. All the ATP requiring energies are cleaving a phosphate off of ATP to create ADP, an inorganic phosphate, so we'll see lots of free phosphate floating around inside the cells. Inorganic phosphate, or phosphate purely on its own, that's P sub I, and they're in equilibrium with a mixture of phosphate, PO4, 3 minus, or monohydrogen phosphate, where we add a hydrogen, or dihydrogen phosphate, where there are two hydrogens. Phosphates are a major component, component of a lot of molecules. Huge component of nucleic acids, definitely phospholipids, components of cell membranes. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, GTP, guanine triphosphate, and cyclic AMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. We also see that you have phosphates on creatine and formation of creatine phosphate. Phosphate's involved in many, many metabolic pathways. It phosphorylates enzymes and substrates. So in the process of glycolysis, 
or taking glucose and phosphorylating it in the upward energy using steps. And then we'll see that in second messenger systems, phosphorylation of kinases, also phosphates involved in buffers that help stabilize pH of body fluids. Phosphate homeostasis is primarily under the renal control and the control of parathyroid hormone. Normally, phosphate's continually lost in the process of glomerular filtration. However, if plasma concentration drops very low, then the renal tubules are going to reabsorb all of the filtered phosphate so they can retain it in the tissues. Parathyroid hormone increases the excretion of phosphate, which increases the concentration of free calcium in the extracellular fluid. However, lowering, lowering extracellular fluid concentration of phosphate is going to minimize the formation of calcium phosphate, thus leaving plenty of calcium free in the blood plasma, aiding in blood plasma concentration of calcium. Imbalances of phosphate are not such a big deal. The body can tolerate broad variations in the concentrations of phosphate, and that's a good thing considering its involvement in so many of the metabolic pathways. So this concludes our section on electrolyte balance. Now we're ready to move on to acid-base balance.